Hello, hello, this is Debbie Dashinger, and welcome to Dare to Dream, my favorite place to be every week. I've got someone special here today who will be joining us in a little bit, and that is Dr. Greta Chamberlain, who's known as a mystic. She is a remote energy transformational specialist, and she channels the non-physical entities known as the realm of beings. Dare to Dream podcast has won three talk radio positive change awards, won the COVR award for best radio and podcast show, Welp magazine, lists Dare to Dream with Debbie Dashinger as one of the top 20 best podcasts to listen to this year, and it is high ranking under self-improvement under Apple Podcasts. This show is sponsored by Dr. Dane here at Access Consciousness. They do energy work out into the world. And you can find out more at Dr. Dane here, H E R dot com. I'm Debbie Dashinger. I'm a media visibility expert. And I take your book to a guaranteed international best selling status. I'm also a book writing coach, and we meet twice a month from anywhere in the world on Zoom. So I can help you take your book, your idea, your inception to completion and published. And additionally, I help people get booked on radio and podcasts. I've got a very small boutique agency that I run for spiritual messengers. And because of that, and because I'm also interviewed all the time on media, I like to teach spiritual messengers how to do this, how to be more visible, because it truly is your time and you are the light showers for this time. If you'd like to learn how to do this on your own, I have a free gift for you so you can learn how with templates and videos. Go to debbie-shinger.com slash gift. That's D-E-B-B-I-D-A-C-H-I-N-G-E-R.com slash gift. My guest is Dr. Greta Chamberlain, DN. She is a remote energy transformational specialist and educator and renowned for her unique connection to the non-physical entities known as the realm of beings. Known as a mystic, Dr. Greta works internationally with individuals. Collaborating with the realm of beings, Dr. Greta has pioneered transformational science, a groundbreaking approach that empowers individuals to forge new life paradigms. Her work gives hope to those seeking relief from debilitative diseases addictive behaviors, and mental health challenges, and instead supporting conscious life experiences. Dr. Greta holds a bachelor and a master's degree in education with her doctorate in napropathic medicine. Her expertise encompasses functional medicine, neuroscience, and clinical psychology. Her podcast, Shifting Impressions, is a platform where Dr. Greta shares profound teachings from the realm of beings. And if you'd like to learn more about Greta, go to therealmofbeings.com. And with that, I welcome the amazing Dr. Greta Chamberlain to Dare to Dream. Welcome. It's so great to have you. It's nice to be here. I'm really excited to dive. Okay. I'll dive with you. Okay. Thank you. I know you sent these things and I I wasn't really planning on going over them, but actually in this moment, it feels really right to talk a little bit about like very interesting life you have led that got you to who you are with me right now today. And as a channeler, can you briefly go over some of the heroine journey you've been on? Well, um, it started when I was a child uh, because I was exposed to the realm of beings at that point in time. But as a child, I didn't know what it was. I just heard uh, someone calling my name, Greta, Greta, you know, and I'm going, whoa, (laughs) you know. Uh, And my mom, when I had uh, uh, certain abilities that I showed, uh, one of which was uh, being aware of when people were going to make their transition. So uh, my mom always told me, don't tell anybody, don't Mm. say anything to anybody that you can do these things because they're going to think that you're insane. So Mm -hmm. I kind of grew up with that, with that certain amount of fear. And then as uh, 
when I went to Africa is kind of where I uh, lost that fear uh, mm. with my first husband because he was um, uh, delving into all kinds of spiritual experiences. So that exposed me uh, to that and to be able to accept more of myself mm. without having the fear of, oh, you know, you can't do that. You can't be that. Don't let anybody know that. So um, it kind of started there. And then um, later on, uh, one of my, I call him my mentor, Tuhuti Sema. Uh, he always says, I, says that I've gone beyond where he taught me. Mm -hmm. But he exposed me to a lady who has made her transition called Dr. Irene Hickman. She was an osteopathic medical doctor, and she was one of the ones that pioneered being able to go remote, not remote viewing. There's a big, there's a distinct difference between the two. So I learned how to go remote uh, from her. I knew uh, from her, I learned how to clear people, how to protect people, and that was about it. Um, then I started channeling more and more the, uh, the uh, realm of beings. I met the realm of beings. I have to backtrack, Debbie. Yeah. I met the uh, realm of beings when I was in Africa because my first husband would always pass out. And I was going and I told him, I said, stop passing out. You can't pass out in the street. How am I going to pick you up? You know? Yeah. So he said, okay, okay, okay. So, but I noticed that when he would go to sleep, a voice would come forth out of his body talking to him. Well, I mean, talking to me, and I was a very curious person, still am. Mm -hmm. And um, so I said, well, who are you? I said, well, let me entertain this, you know, individual. And that's when um, I met the entity that I call my father. Mm -hmm. um, and he um, uh, told me that, um, well, first of all, I didn't believe it. So then I said to him, tell me something that I did when I was a child, which I have never told anybody. And I'm not going to say it here either. <laughs> but okay. <laughs> but uh, he told me, and I said, oh my God, he's been watching me since I was a kid. <laughs> you, <Whoa>. know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, uh, so then I knew the, the voices calling my name that was them. I was beginning to connect all these things together. And so he told me that usually people have one, but I have seven. Mm. Um, one was a woman and the others have male voices. Seven guides or seven entities uh, creating the collective, the realm of beings? I think it was the collective realm of beings. Mm. I think that's what it was. You know, um, Although I have a slew of ascended masters, but I um, put them in that category of being the realm of beings as well. Okay. Because I have certain ones uh, work with me, especially if I have to uh, go out and bring someone back from a portal, which is another space where people can get stuck. And I have to go out and get them that ascended master along with the time trackers assist me in that process may i ask you so i've never heard that before mm. what does that mean exactly what does that mean for the person and how do they get stuck in a portal well you can get stuck in a portal in various ways one of the ways that you will know you're in one is if you have a nightmare mm. so nightmares just don't pop up and appear you have see there are three things you can have a vision you can have a dream you can have a nightmare mm -hmm. if you have a vision that means you're seeing you're in a reality that you can see the entire space clear where you are at that moment and you'll you'll be given a message okay that can even be done in your sleep okay so that's a vision if you have a dream um it'll seem kind of discombobulated and different people or things will be moving through it. And dreams are symbols. 
So mm -hmm. that's a way for your unconscious to let you know what's going on with it in relationship to you. If you have a nightmare, like so you wake up and something scary, yeah, you know, then you know that more than likely you're in a portal. Oh. So that you've been taken into that space. Now, how do you get into them? You can walk into them. You can walk into them. Um, they can come to you. Like I had a lady that I was facilitating for. Uh, she was an, an interesting one because when she would walk out of her apartment to walk to work because her job was close by, she would see people on the street and they're all laughing at her, making fun of her. And when she would go into her job, it would stop. Mm. When she came from her job and went back outside again, it would, um, the, the whole thing would start again. So I knew she was in a portal, so I had to go in and take her out of there. That is weird. Yes, okay. I had a young man that was in a portal since he was five. And the only reason why I knew that was because when I was facilitating for him, he told me, he said, I only see, when I dream, I only see black and gray. So I said, that's all you see? He said, yes. And I said, oh, we've got a big problem here. So um, I can go into a person's dream and see exactly what's going on in the dream, see why are they doing that. So I said, take me where so-and-so is. So they took me and I saw exactly what the portal looked like because now I'm in the portal with him. And it was all gray and black. And it influenced him such a degree that even clothing that he wore was always black and gray. Mm -hmm. He never wore different colored t-shirts or anything. Everything was always black. Everything was always gray. So uh, even his apartment, the walls were gray. The furniture was gray, everything. So it emulated the portal that he was in. And he had been in there since he was five. When I worked on him, he was about 32 years old. So he had been in there approximately 30 years and did not recognize. Because mm -hmm. remember, time is a humanoid construct. Mm -hmm. So in all the realities, time does not really exist. So we pulled him out of there and um, he started dreaming in color. He started wearing uh, different colors, yellows, and bringing in color into his apartment and so forth. Mm -hmm. So that's another example of being in a court. Thank you. Okay, mm -hmm. so Dr. Irene Hickman teaches you about clearing people. And then where do you go from there? What I did was, you know, to tell you the honest truth, I think about it. I've been thinking about it since I know that we were going to talk. And I'm going, when did I start doing that? It's it it became so natural to me. Mm. I really can't pinpoint to say, okay, I started doing it then. Yeah. I just knew that when she showed me, along with others that she trained as well, how to go remote, I realized I could go anywhere. That means if I can go anywhere, literally, I can go inside your body. Literally, I can see every cell in your body. I can go into the cells, and that's what we train our other specialists to do, is to go into your body. We can look. We can talk to your cells because we look at the cells as a species, not as just a cell in your body. So they have their own creations of reality as well. We can have conversations with them. How are you doing? Okay, you like this energy better than you like that energy. All that kind of stuff goes on with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, this is so interesting to me. So what then, because clearly, I mean, first of all, bravo, your education alone is so impressive to go all the way up to doctorate, to have the many certifications and expertise that you have and then on top of it, here's the science. You've got the spirituality that is innate to you. You've had it since you were a child, only built upon it or expressed it more largely. And so you've got both of these going on. 
and you've known the realm of beings since you were a young child. Mm -hmm. What then is the difference between you and what you can do, what Dr. Greta can do, and what the realm of beings can do when you work with somebody? Um, we work as a whole. There's no um, separation. Uh, one thing that we do with the uh, transformation science is that we teach that separation is an illusion. So they're a part of me. They are me and I am the realm of beings. And, and that's how we operate. Now, when they want to communicate with me, um, like let's say there's something that's very, very important. It's usually it's done telepathically. It'll be like a thought will pass through. Uh, when I'm working on somebody facilitating for a person, they're there because they're actually doing the work. So, and I'm the conduit for the work. So they um, they will, I'll pick it up just automatically. I feel it, okay? I know I have to put yellow energy in this person's digestive system or I have to go in to work with the dopaminergic neurons. I have to do that. They'll guide me to do that. And once I get there, they'll guide me to where I'm supposed, what I'm supposed to do, okay? But if there's something that they feel that that's very paramount, like for example, I was writing, I've always been interested in what is soul. And I remember I was going, I would go to different places and I'd ask people, I said, what is soul? And then I remember one gentleman said, well, I'll talk to you later. Well, when he said he'll talk to me later, I knew he didn't know what it was either. So, oh. you know, so I that day I said, this was years ago now, I said, I'm going to do a PowerPoint because I usually do PowerPoints when I teach. I said, I'm going to do a PowerPoint on soul. I'm going to figure this out instead of uh, relying on others. So I sat down and then I got up. I said, well, let me take a break. I went to my kitchen. Now my kitchen has a very high electromagnetic force in it. So when I can stand in my kitchen, I can receive all kinds of visions. I can receive messages and that type of thing. So I'm standing by my kitchen table and I hear this voice said, Soul is a humanoid construct, just like that, exactly. Soul is a humanoid construct. So I knew that they were talking to me and they didn't want me to miss that. So then I heard them, literally heard them, and they spoke in English to me. Mm -hmm. They could speak in any language that they want to speak in. So um, then I asked right there in the kitchen. I said, okay, if soul is a humanoid construct, what am I supposed to be writing on? And that's when they said the unconscious. Mm -hmm. And that started my understanding of what the unconscious truly is. And it started me on learning um, what is the force that creates all of existence. Mm. Yeah, so that started- Wild topic. <laughs> you pick oh, yeah. the easy ones. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, we're going to get into all of that. And I know okay. you're going to be doing some channeling in a little bit, but I, I want to talk some more about this. Very fascinating stuff. You've mentioned the word humanoid a couple of times. And I understand that somewhere on your journey, Greta, you learned about being Octurian and not entirely humanoid. <clears throat> so can you elaborate on what does that mean for you to be an Octurian? I have a client who's an Octurian hybrid. So this now this stuff has become pedestrian in my life, which is such a beautiful thing. Like I'm used to this and I'm used to meeting people. I understand we are all from various star systems, galaxies. That's mm -hmm. our galactic heritage. Um, but at the same time, there's no doubt Every so often I meet someone or someone comes to work with me and I'm like, oh, you're definitely not fully from here. Like I really can tell how they function and be there's some, there is a wiring that is not earth. And so how is that for you? Can you elaborate on being Octurian, what it means and how it has shaped your identity and your purpose? 
Well, first, I didn't know I was Arcturian. I had never even heard the word Arcturian. Wow. And, um, but one day, uh, my husband and I had moved from Sierra Leone to Liberia. Um, he was challenged. He had a lot of challenges, mental challenges. And I remember saying to myself, okay, I don't know if I'm going to make it this time through all of these challenges. Because he had started to improve and then he started to do a swing toward the old paradigm of operation. So I, I just didn't know. I just didn't know how I was going to make it. So one day I was asleep. And I was in that space, that reality where you can see the vision. Remember, I told you, you can see everything there. And I saw these little balls of light, about maybe two inches in diameter, coming, seven of them, coming out of the ceiling. And they were speaking because at that time, I didn't carry enough energy to be able to um, speak uh, with them or to speak uh, normally, as you would call normally, like I'm talking now. So what I heard them say to me, because they had to slow themselves down to get the message across to me, but in essence, they were telling me, we've come to take you back. Mm. And I said, you've come to take me back. And then I just automatically started talking to them. I said, I'm not going. <laughs> I refuse to go. And then I, you know, you try and wake yourself up and then you wind up back and sleeping again. And here they come, they're getting closer this time, telling the same thing. You know, we're coming to take you back. And I kept saying to them, no, I'm not going. I refuse it. So then the third time, I'm still trying to wake myself up, can't wake myself up. And they're closer even then to me. And I said, look, I'm not going. I have things I have to do that I'm committed to do. I will come when I'm finished. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I said that to them, they left. Okay, now, my first husband dies. Mm -hmm. I come back to the United States. And I'm talking to somebody. And I, Debbie, I cannot to this day remember who that person was. But it was somebody who could see, mm -hmm. you know, psychically and uh, you know, had in-depth understanding of these things. So I explained to them what had happened to me. And he, and he, I think it was a he, he said, oh, you're Arcturian. I said, Arcturian, because when they were coming, telling me they were coming to get me, to take me back, I knew I belonged to them. I knew I looked like them. Mm. I knew there was a belonging there. And that's why I could tell them, I'm not going with you this time. So when he told me I was Arcturian, I said, oh, that kind of resonated with me. So then I said, well, I guess that must be what I am. So then I went on YouTube. A friend of mine, actually, she went on YouTube and she was looking up Arcturians. They said they're purple people with three fingers. <laughs> and I'm going, mm, no, I don't think so. At least I'm not purple and I don't have three fingers. I'm just a ball of light, mm. but that ball of light carries more energy than my humanoid body can afford. So sometimes I do uh, shape shift and mm. I will purposely shape shift into my Arcturian body because I know I have more energy to work with when I do that than if I stay in this humanoid body. So that's like your fueling station? Where you go, you transmute yourself back, shape shift into the light, and then you can carry that into this human experience. I just see myself. I know it's like you would see me still being Greta as you see me, but I know that in another reality, I can shape shift myself. Mm -hmm. Very, and cool. I'm only I'm very small. I'm only a ball of light. Mm -hmm. you know, there's nothing purple about me whatsoever, <laughs> nor do I have three fingers. So. Um, but it's, um, I have more quote unquote power. I don't like that word power, but that's why I'm putting it in quotes, you know, more strength to do the, to do the work. Yeah. I know you talk about being part of the universal federation and I find that intriguing. 
how does the collaboration that you have with the Universal Federation manifest? What role do you play with this cosmic alliance? Um, sometimes um, I've had to, uh, their requests, like their requests made through the realm of beings, mm -hmm. like there are uh, three gods. Uh, I was reading uh, The Keys of Enoch by J.J. Mm -hmm. Hitchcock. Totally. And, yes. And when I got to the part that it said there are three gods in the universe, that really resonated with me. Mm -hmm. I knew that that was, that was accurate. So knowing that and being able to be exposed to that, you know, I was requested that one of my tasks here is to assist people in uh, learning um, unconditional love, but not only unconditional love of others, but first learning unconditional love for yourself. Mm. and they wanted uh, one of the mandates for this universe by way of the three gods that created this universe was that they wanted um, the universe fully 100% of the universe to accept the idea of unconditionally loving which means then you understand that there's no separation mm. so uh, with that in mind, um, I was asked to go to the Universal Federation, but I could not just, I was asked to do that because they don't tell me what to do because they honor my ability to create my own reality. Mm -hmm. So they respect that uh, thoroughly. So, uh, but in order to do that, I had to go to the Arturian Council because I'm Arturian. And I had to say, I'm going because when I go there, I'm going to be representing, uh, you know, uh, the Arcturian population. So I said, can I have permission to go to the Universal Federation? And they said, yes, they gave me permission. So then off I went. I had, All you have to do is ask. I said, take me to the Universal Federation. Because I learned that with remote. I can ask to go anywhere. So they took me there. And it was an interesting place because when I walked in there, um, my clothes change. Hmm. And uh, I wind up in this uh, long white gown. It's really soft because I can feel it with long winged sleeves, hmm. you know, just a cut like that. I think um, he looks beautiful. I'm seeing it right now. <laughs> And no shoes. I'm just standing there. And I'm standing at, I would call a podium. You know, I'm sure it's an energy type of situation. And I requested them. I said, on behalf of the three gods that created this universe, they want us to be in alignment with unconditional love. And uh, I'm asking you to see if all of you would be in agreement for that. Who would be in agreement? Who would not be in agreement? And I told them, I said, I, I'm the adversary for them at this point. And I was accepted as the adversary. So I said, okay, I will be back for the answer in two, what's equivalent to two humanoid days. I have to say that so that they'll have to understand because everybody's got their own concept of it. So I had to tell them in humanoid two days, I will be back. So I went back for the answer and the answer was 50% of the universe was in keeping with unconditional love. 50% was not. Mm -hmm. And after that, then that was the interesting thing because there was a planet that was created there are three planets that i'm responsible for okay one planet is where various species various cognitive species like us reside and they reside there because they're coming from all belief systems all different types of planets and everything and they're living there and it was set up specifically to show 
that people are individuals, not people, but individuals who are different from each other can live together, can move together, can appreciate each other. So it was set up for that. So the other 50% that did not want to accept unconditional love as the basis of operation decided that they were going to attack. So there were battles going on in space that people here in this reality were not privy to. So there were a lot of things that, that took place there. Uh, three times, uh, because I'd always be notified because I'm part of my responsibility is I must be there. And my husband, um, who is not humanoid, is also plays a very important part in that. And yeah. is this, I don't know how to say it, Datar, Datar? Datar. The re reptilian, is this correct? Yes. And so you are, uh, through that relationship, um, a mother of 13, distinctive yes. aspect of your life. Yes. Does this interspecies family dynamic work? What lessons have you learned from that relationship, that family? Um, I've learned more about oneness. Mm -hmm. I've learned that there more about that there's no need for separation. Mm -hmm. I've learned to be more accepting of various individuals, regardless of what they look like, regardless of where they come from, you know, that I will only um, treat them with unconditional love. Like when I say that there were battles, I don't want you to think I got out there and cut people's heads off and everything. That did, it doesn't, I don't do that. What happens is that I just send out of my body unconditional love and it comes out it just zooms out and I just give that and that's that is what we use to um uh to deal with that situation so I've had to uh, the dynamic um I'm wife number five uh in the pecking order um but I'm the only humanoid wife that he has the others are uh, reptilian and I know that he has about two or three others past me you know and their children but they were they were very uh, accepting of me because people here have very uh, negative thoughts about um, us, the reptilian species that's uh, cognitive and um I remember a friend of mine came over to my house. She said, oh, no, we have to destroy them. We have to get rid of them. They're blah, 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 and all this kind of stuff. I said, well, that's not all of them. No, and I, I just want to speak to that for one minute because I'm actually guilty of that. When I first began opening up to all of this extraterrestrial UFO co conversation, because I was a big eye roller at one point in my life, but when I woke up, I woke and one of my very first conversations with a woman who channels extraterrestrials many years ago, I made that mistake. And I said something about, you know, how bad reptilians were or some something to that idea. And she was, you know, immediately corrected me that that was in fact totally erroneous. There were many different kinds of reptilians. And in fact, you know, brilliant reptilians. And, and after she was done and she did it very kindly, but I got the message. Like I was really clear. Oh, wow. I got that so wrong. And then we used to tease in our household that we were going to make up t-shirts that say reptilian lives matter. Right. Oh, <laughs> oh that's great. Because we realized, you know, that was racist of me galactically to think that, you know, there was a being out there somewhere that just got this bad rap when in fact, it's not even true, you know, and they're right. amazing people. And now, of course, now that I'm deeply in this world, and I meet people like you, 
And I meet people who are reptilian or channel reptilian or, you know, whatever, come from that lineage, doesn't matter, but it's, they're brilliant, beautiful, sumptuous people. So yes, to what your friend said, and yes, to call myself out, I did the same <laughs> thing. And, and it's yeah. just not true. Well, there are some that are very challenging because at one point, in time, they wanted to, uh, well, my husband, Datar, let me backtrack. My husband, Datar, was the one that headed up everything, anything that wars and all kinds of stuff that went into this reality. He was the head of that to create that. It was that in our relationship with each other, uh, of which the reason being how it started was that at one o'clock in the morning, I received a call from a, a family in South Carolina and they said they won't live on a farm. They're still with me. And um, they said, you've got to come and help us. There are things in the walls and we're frightened. We don't know what to do. So I said, okay, I'm coming. So when I came, I cleared out everything that was in the walls, but I could see that they were reptilian. And I could see you know, like there's tall grass that was growing in the fields of the farm. And I could see all of these reptilians because they're tall. They're like, my husband's nine feet tall, for God's sake, you know. So their heads were above the grass. And I said, whoa. And I'm here all by myself. I said, what are they doing? You know, I'll show you how naive I was. What are they doing? And then before I knew it, I was in a black space. And I said, okay, I'm in this black space. So I asked the realm, because they're always with me, regardless of where I go. I said, okay, show me where I am. So then I saw golden bars coming down and I knew I had been captured and I knew I was in a cell. And then I saw this tall individual walk through the walls and come into the cell with me. After that, I did not know what was going on. But I had, I, it took me a day to get out of there. Another woman that I was training, I'm no longer training her. Uh, uh, she, she helped me between the two of us because uh, I called her immediately and I said, look, I'm, I'm caught and I can't get out of here. I haven't figured out how to do it. She tried to get, she said, I can't get you out either. I said, okay, this is what we're going to do. Uh, you go to sleep. I'm going to sleep. We'll wake up in the morning. I'll call you and then we'll try and get me out of here. And um, so we were successful with that. In the meantime, now, there's a portal created in my bedroom where uh, individuals can pass through into my bedroom at any point in time. Uh, so he kept coming uh, through the portal. And I'm going, I asked the realm of beings, I told him, I said, I said, look, y'all, this man tried to, not man, but individual, tried to kill me so I said so what do you what are we going to do about this and they said all you're to do is to love him that was it that was the directive and so I when they tell me something I know they're telling it to me for my good so uh, that's what I did then he fell in love with me we got married and then we had 13 kids and how how does your relationship function when he comes in, Datar? Is it like he's real and can you consummate if you've had children? How do yeah. you consummate? I mean, I know that's a very intimate question for me to ask, but <laughs> if you can, I'm open, but if you can, oh, okay. this, you can. <laughs> yes, I mean, uh, uh, he has a penis that's inserted inside me. I can feel it. Uh, but one thing about the children, and I can feel him as well as he can feel me. It's like a merging of two realities when mm -hmm. we come together. Mm -hmm. And um, you decide in his cultural framework, you decide what type of children you want to have. So our first child, you know, he said, I want to have a boy. I said, okay, I'd like to have a boy too. So when I became pregnant, I was pregnant with a boy. And in one, in this reality, you don't see 
my uterus expanding. And another reality where I'm existing with them and him, I can see that. And then I know when it's time to give birth. Yeah, and I definitely go to where the women are and they help me give birth. And I, uh, I can feel it. I know I've given birth, you know, just like any other, if, as though I had given it here. I have the same feelings. Um, the first child, the child then, just like we do at the incarnate stage, we choose our bodies and all of that. Okay. He chose to have a humanoid head. He's a kind of, uh, not kind of caramel color. And he's got real light, fluffy hair on his head, like curls, but it's real fluffy, real soft, very whole total humanoid face. But his um, his body is reptilian. That's the way he created his body. Our second son created uh, to look exactly like his father. Exactly. I should have brought the picture down so that you could have seen what Datar looks like. But this I've, is amazing I, that you can even exist in these di several dimensions, essentially, or universes at the same time and be cognizant of all of them. And yeah. Yeah. I also, I don't underestimate this directive that you receive from the Universal Federation. It is really clear to me, certainly, that our way out right now is through love. It's through healing the self that this world, this planet, humanity is going to be healed. And mm. we're very much at the crossroads. So that's huge. What they asked you to do, uh, not easy under some circumstances, certainly. And um, I'm, yeah, I'm very impressed by everything you're saying. So if it's okay with you, <clears throat> can we shift Mm -hmm. to channeling, I would love for the audience to have an experience of the realm of beings and you together. And is there anything we need to know about what happens while they're coming through you? Uh, one thing that I need to tell you is that I call it stepping back. I don't know how other people channel. You know, I know that there are many people that channel all around the world in fact but I have a stepping back it's like I trade paces they're coming forward they're with me all the time but they step forward I step back now when I step back you're going to have to control the whole situation in that I have no perception of time I will not when I'm in that space I don't know if when five minutes have gone by or whatever. In our Shifting Impressions podcast, when they're speaking, uh, one of the women will always say, okay, Realm, we're getting ready to shut down because they know I have no concept of it. You know, they'll talk forever now. They, they enjoy talking, <laughs> let me tell you that. You know, I know they're excited about this as, as much as excited as a, a non-entity can be. <laughs> but... Um, yeah. So that's the big thing. You'll have to know that. So when you want them to stop, you have to tell them because I have no. And the other thing is a lot of times I don't know what they've said. I don't stay cognizant of what they've said. So uh, people will tell me, you know, what you said such and such. I said, oh, they did. That's all. Oh, that's interesting. You know, so people tell me what they've said. OK. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's super helpful. Thank you. And I got you. I'm okay. I totally have you. Okay. Okay. And I don't know who's going to come. You know, people tell me that they have different personalities. You know, so we see some of them are, are much have a more sense of humor than others. So uh, that's where we are with that. Mm -hmm. okay so you want that now that would be amazing thank you so All much right. we, no we lovingly unconditionally mm -hmm. invite them to join us now
Hi. Hello, hello. Welcome. Thank you. We're very, very glad to be here with you. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining. I have so many questions for you. And I would like to start first with saying, what about the cosmos? What do we humans not know about the cosmos that we would actually be surprised to learn? Oh, there's so much you don't know. First, you don't know of all the beings that exist. And I'm I'm assuming that you're saying cosmos is the universe. Is that correct? I think what I mean, because actually universe feels small to me. So maybe all the galaxies, all of space and time. Yes. What is it that we don't know about that cosmos? Well, the one thing is that everything goes into infinity. So when you say cosmos, that is something that never ends. Like here, let's say that uh, this universe uh, that we're in is universe number 56. But there is a universe number 2,349. You see. So the force creates endlessly and never stops creating. It's continuing to explore itself over and over and over again. So what do humans not know of the cosmos? Millions and millions and millions and trillions of things they do not know and more than that. Mm, wow. That humanoids try to set up ways to understand existence. We're going to use the term existence in connection with your term called cosmos. Existence. What do humans set up to try to understand existence? They set up dimensions. You're in the third dimension. You're in the fifth dimension and so forth. This is the only place that thinks of existence divided into dimension. If you went somewhere else and said, you know, I'm coming from the third dimension. Some, they're going to look at you and say, what? What are you saying? Where, where, what is that? Because it's a humanoid construct. Now realities, the spaces and the realities that you create, you're creating so many realities at the same time. Humanoids do not understand how powerful they are. They do not understand that they create everything in their existence. They do not understand that. Everything. It's not that you discover, like we discovered DNA. No, you did not discover DNA. You created DNA. You create everything that you have. But in the humanoid experience, you see, Debbie, there are so many illusions. That's what this reality is about, illusions. It's an illusion that you and I, even though I am an entity that's coming through Greta, I'm a thought entity. I'm pure thought. I don't have a corporal body attached to. But to deal with this humanoid experience, we utilize Greta's body to do the things that way. And it's good for her. She, it's good for her. She's learning so many things, you know. And it's not a learning. Let us correct that. We want to say that everyone in this reality that is humanoid understands everything that we are saying right now. What happens is you've forgotten it. Because when you come into this space, you come into this space with blinders on so that you only are going to look at one reality. 
Now grant you, there are those of you who can see beyond just one reality. You can see other realities, that's true. But most of you have the blinders on and you look in only that section and you stay within that space and you let those five senses that you were given as humanoid, hearing, seeing, touching, smelling, whatever the other fifth one is, you use that. If, you, if I can feel it, it's real. If I can... If I can see it, it's real. If I can smell it, it's real. You see, the turkey at Christmas time sitting on your table is real to you because you smell it. It smells good. You can't wait to chomp on it, you know. But what you don't realize that that is the body that you created for that turkey to have so that you can see that turkey, so that you can smell that turkey. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. If we got rid of the body of the turkey, Debbie, it's nothing but energy. That's hilarious. <laughs> I mean, it really is just such a cosmic joke in a way. I Thank you for that. And I can really feel that, how much we don't know how much we're not aware of. So if if I have never had, and I, I euphemistically for everybody I'm speaking, but if I have not had extraterrestrial contact or I have not had hybrid experience as Debbie Dashinger, like Greta does, how would I even know alien life if I saw it or engaged in it? Most people wouldn't. And most people, humanoids, would not want to. Because for many people, to say that is scary. And see, uh, we're getting into that whole thing of what is called, quote unquote, extraterrestrial life. Uh, I don't see myself as an extraterrestrial being, by the way. But anyway, um, you know, uh, you have to see it. That's why you have these little things, these little things swirling around looking like uh, those uh, uh, ships, spaceships twirling, <laughs> twirling around and... And then you have the species that, you know, they're kind of funny, but there are species, you you call them the greys here. Yeah. yeah. And sometimes you will see we've captured greys and we're holding them here. Yeah, you might have, but you have to understand that the gray created for you to be able to see it. Otherwise you wouldn't see it. It's created itself to be present so you can see it. That's what the that's what it does. So there are a lot of species. This is what's very interesting, Debbie. I'm so glad you brought this up because you see, there are species right where you are right now, but you don't see them because well, they're. May I ask what you mean by that specifically? There's species right here where I am right now. Could be. They're all over the place. You know, like for instance. There's a group, uh, they call them the shadow people. They are very interesting. They're very, they're curious, very curious that they don't, they don't do any harm to anybody. They just like to come and look. And they will, uh, you'll, you'll know when they're around because you, you'll feel, say, oh, oh, I thought something was over there. And now it's not there. You feel it, you see, that's that feeling. So that's how you can say, okay, something must have been there. Because they move very quickly. You know, they move very quickly. And it, they look like shadows, very light. And they're in this reality. And they are what you would call extraterrestrial. There's another species. Oh, she's, she, she, they, they are interesting. They're females. Uh, you'll know when you've met them because for some odd reason, they like to go around scratching people. 
and you will see a scratch maybe going across your chest, a really long scratch. And you go and you wake up in the morning and you say, I have a scratch. Or somebody will say, you have a scratch on your back. How did you get that? And I don't know how I got it. Well, that was a, a little visit. And sometimes the things, they will bring them into the actualization of this reality. But most of the time, they're outside of the actualization. They're in another reality that you're not privy to. That's overlaying. You see... Uh, people deal with this whole concept of time. Um, Greta, we're going to share Greta's uh, uh, understanding of it, and that is a bowl of mashed potatoes. She likes <laughs> potatoes. Okay. So he has decided that the way to explain time to everybody is a bowl of mashed potatoes. It's all mushed up in there together. It's not running in a spiral. You know, some people say it's it's spiral. No, it's not a spiral. It's not a spiral. It's all happening simultaneously together. You see, everything is in that bowl of mashed potatoes. Yes. Mm. And you know how sticky mashed potatoes are. You see. So it sticks together. The energy holds it together. Mm. Yes. Mm. Yes. Mm -hmm. So that's what we mean, that you have extraterrestrials around that you aren't necessarily privy to, but they're here. They've been here. They come and they go. Some want you to see them, some don't. It's just like when you somebody dies and you have this thing, earthbounds, they decide they don't want to go anywhere and they stay here and they become ghosts. So you see them. But some people will see them walking. Other people will not because you're not opening your blinders to see it. You see, for various reasons. One, I don't believe in that stuff. Those things don't exist. Or two, oh, I'm too scared to believe in that. I don't want to see anything like that. Don't show that to me. But yet, but you know what we find quite interesting about humanoids is that they go and create these horror movies that will scare themselves. Sitting, eating popcorn, looking at horror movies and enjoying these things to be scared but don't want to expand the blinders to see what else is out there. That's too frightening. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. I, I'd i like to talk a little bit about DNA. I have this fascination. I know you said it's a humanoid construct. I heard you. So if I could uh, talk about a little bit of human history and how Gosh, I hate calling them aliens, right? Is there a better word to say beings from other planets, galaxies, universes? Um, or individuals. Okay, individuals. Sometimes our cosmic brothers and sisters, our star brothers and sisters. How much of their DNA is part of us? Uh, did the Anunnaki, were they the inception of changes to the human DNA? Or how did that come about? Hmm. That is very interesting because one way for us to say that is that we are all one. In other words, Debbie, Greta was saying she's humanoid and Arcturian. But as Greta can say that, so can you. You can see yourself as being an Anunnakian or Hawthorne or Palladian you see. But let's go into, let's delve into that. The Anunnakians are a species that chose at the incarnate stage, it was chosen, I'm going to experience being Anunnakian. So when you're exposing and, and experiencing being Anunnakian, there are certain things that go with 
being Anunnaki and certain realities that you create that you're exposed to. Because see, all of this, all of this existence or cosmos is set up for the experiential evolution of the force itself, of which we are it. You are not part of the force. You are it. You are not Anunnakian because you are humanoid. You are Anunnakian because you are the force. And the force is everything. So we are everything. We just set ourselves up in these little spaces. So the Anunnakians decided, just like they did here, uh, let's create something. We want to understand how this whole magnificent beingness comes about. So let's look into that. There's got to be something about that. So therefore, they're going to create that. You see, they create that. It's just like, for instance, in your place you call Europe. Think back when the car was being fixed. If I'm not mistaken, I think there was somebody creating the car someplace in Europe while Ford was creating the car here in this country. You see, both cars being created. How is that possible? Because we all are one and we share all of the knowledge. It's just that some of it we put on the back burner because we can't handle it. Does that kind of answer your question? Kind of. Are we are we actually a chromosomal genetic soup of alien individuals? Are is there are, are there any thoroughbreds that exist on our planet? Is there even such a thing truly as a human that is distinguished from any other planet? I truly understand energetically what you're referring to. We are all one. But I am curious about the DNA that runs through us. I would say, to be transparent, besides the fact that it is very fascinating to me, I'm also really curious because I feel like this is a way forward. If there is no separation, if in fact, the DNA that runs through my body, Greta's body, everyone who's watching or listening's body, if we're actually the same, as our star brothers and sisters, then there truly is no separation. So I'm curious because I feel like when undeniable open contact occurs, this could be such an important point that might help some people to have more acceptance or to invite more that we become part of the galactic community. That's the basis of the question. We must discuss the white body. Now, that means we must discuss the force. Like you have fingers on your hand. If I say, give me your hand, you're not going to say, Greta, wait a minute, I've got to take my fingers off and that, that's, that's my hand. Your digits are all part of your hand. But each little digit, what you call fingers, does something. It has a responsibility toward the hand. The thumb has a responsibility, but it's still the hand. So the force has different fingers. That is it. That is one of the parts, because you're asking me that question, is called the white body. It's round. It's white. It's just a round circle. It's one of the fingers of the force. Inside that round circle is the design for everything that is in 
the universe and in the cosmos and in existence. It contains all of that. So when you reach out to be humanoid, part of the design, you're going to design your physical body. There are things that you see and things that you don't see about it, but you're designing it to be the best that you can for what it is. Because the force designs the body after it decides that you're going to be a humanoid female and what reality you're going to be in, you see. So within that, you have, within your design, you have all of these components that uh, work with you to create that physical body and to move with that physical body. What you don't see are the other things that go with it because you're focused in this body. You believe that this physical vehicle that you can see is it. And you don't know all the other possibilities. You're beginning to learn them. So what do you do as scientists? You create things to be able to learn how does this physical body function? But those things were in place there because from the design of a humanoid was going to have this, you see. This is part of the corporal body of the humanoid. What you don't see are the subtle bodies that go with being humanoid. You see, you have other bodies as well. This physical body is just one of them. Some of them uh, here, you know of, like you speak of the emotional body, the mental body, the astral body. Everybody knows, well, the astral body is what takes me to various places. I'm traveling with the astral body. So you've learned that. You've created to know that. But there are a lot of other subtle bodies. You have a subtle body that takes care of your muscles. You have a subtle body that takes care of the chemicals in your body. We call it the chemical body. You see, you have all those separate things. Then you have what some people call the, um, I guess, the body of light. Uh, I think somebody said that. But it's the etheric body. And that etheric body does something. You have trillions of the etheric bodies. You see, it's what you believe. Let's go to the chakras. It's a really good example. There's a belief that you only have seven. Because I, it's, it's in books. You know, you have the pretty colors, orange and green and yellow, and they all represent something and you have seven. My goodness, my goodness, my goodness. Then you have another group that says, well, there are only four chakras. Then you have another group that says, there are 36 chakras. You see how, it, the, it, how that creation is taking place. So, But the actual creation of it is that you, for this humanoid form, you have trillions of chakras. Mm -hmm. Every cell in your body has a set of chakras. Wow. Okay? Because of the electromagnetic body. You know you're an electromagnetic person. You've heard that. But there's a body that's an electromagnetic body that's connected to everything inside your physical body that most people don't know. But it's connected. It's like if you're going to uh, look at a uh, you got to turn the light on. It's got to be connected to the electricity, right? If you pull it out of the plug and it's not connected, it's not going to come on. So what happens is disease that you have, the diseases, be they mental, be they physical, whatever, is a disconnect from your electromagnetic body. 
because it's not receiving the juice it mm -hmm. needs to be in a state of, of humanoid perfection. You see. So scientists here are creating all kinds of interesting things and they're creating them for them to work. They want them to work. So they create it to work. It's not that they're discovering anything. They're creating it. You see. So when you ask us about the DNA, the Anunnakians might have said, okay, they might not even call it DNA. They probably called it something else and said, okay, this is this is this is what we think. We're creating this for us. This is how it fits for us. But the scientists here created, look how many steps they went through to figure that, okay, we're going to have it uh, look like a, a spiral. You see, a DNA spiral. That's what we're going to have it look like. So they created that. And what did people do? Everybody said, that's wonderful idea. Yes, that works. So then all of a sudden, everybody could see it looking like a little spiral because they created it to be that way. Mm -hmm. It's all about creation of reality. You see, it's all about that. When you take away all of these bodily forms of everything, you're only going to see energy. And you're not going to see this part of energy over here, this part of energy over here, this part of energy over here. No, 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 no. You will only see one energy. May I ask, when you were referring to this, let's say this, I don't know how to say it, but this large electrical system that we're plugged into and that sometimes there are parts of our body that aren't getting the juice, as you said, and it creates disease. And in our emails, uh, when Greta agreed to come on the show, she said that you would offer me a healing. And so this feels like an amazing segue for a physical healing if you're willing to do the work. And I don't know if you want me to tell you what's going on um, or if you figure that out on your own, tell me if it helps if I let you know. Hmm. You say that you want us to look at you and do a healing for you. Yes, please. Yeah. Oh, wonderful, wonderful, mm -hmm. wonderful. When we're looking at you, we're looking at all of you as much as possible as we see it. First thing we're going to look at is what is called the flow of you. It For Greta, it appears this way because this is the way she created to see it. Mm -hmm. It's four, six inches high, four inches wide, like a rectangle. There's energy pouring down, flowing down. And I'm using down so that people can have an idea. Okay, but it's not really down. But let's say it's flowing down and then the energy is flowing up and it's meshing in between each other. You see, that is the point we can look at you and see that um, how you're doing. Because instead of seeing the chemical body, the uh, digestive tract, the electromagnetic body, the nerve body, instead of doing all that, we just look at it as a whole. If it's bright, bright yellow and what everything is doing, everything is going right. Yours has a little challenge to it. It's not quite bright. So now, mm -hmm. let us look at you from the outside. All right, we're looking at you in a different reality now. We're not looking at Debbie as people see you in that reality on this video. We are looking at you still in that same place, but another aspect of you. 
You see, there are many aspects. We can have millions and millions of aspects. You know, here scientists are trying to clone people, clone <laughs> animals, and things like that. And all you can do is just say to yourself, divide me up into one million Gretas and you got it like that. But anyway, you know, sometimes things just move slower than what you want. But anyway, let's see. I think it's going to be better for you to tell us because we don't want to say something that does not need to be said for you. So what do you, and for others to be aware of? Is what that we're is very kind, by the way. Thank you. I receive that kindness. And yes, um, that makes a lot of sense. So for the sake of privacy, et cetera, what I am referring to specifically is uh, my bones and my joints. And I, some of the words I've been told are arthritis, right knee, right shoulder, uh, I don't really understand it. I'm sure there is some arthritis in there, um, also tendonitis, and there's also some arthritis in my neck and spine. And yeah, it's super unpleasant. And I do many, many, many things, healing-wise, supplement-wise, et cetera. But um, that's what I really love, some assistance and facilitation on. All right. The facilitation for you would not only just be physical mm. because everything starts from thought. Okay. And after you have the thought, then you have the emotion that pushes the thought into actuality. So your arthritis, you have created it. Now, uh, we suggest that there you're going to find out, look up, why do you, what does arthritis represent for you, you see? What does arthritis represent? So we suggest that there are two, there are other books that have the information, but one that Greta uses a lot and the facilitators use it a lot is the one from Louise Hay. That's a quickie. Heal your body. Because some in there, she has these mental equivalencies. So you want to find out what is the mental equivalency for arthritis? Why do I have that in the first place? Now, there's another big book that's about maybe an inch and a half to two inches. And it is the Encyclopedia of Ailments and Diseases by this gentleman known as Jacques Martel. He mm -hmm. comes from Canada, French Canada, if I'm not mistaken. So the book has been translated in many languages. So he even gets into more specifics than Louise Hay. For instance, every tooth in your mouth means something, you see. If you have a toothache in, in, in uh, tooth number 36, that means something. If you have a toothache in tooth number five, that means something. Now, for you, unless you have gone to have an x-ray and the people can tell you, okay, your arthritis is sitting on... Uh, vertebrae number three, vertebrae number four, vertebrae number five, then you'll be able to look that up in Jacques Martel and each vertebrae has a mental equivalency for you to learn. And what are those mental equivalencies? They're going to show you where your unconscious mind is. May I ask you about this? Because I've already looked into this mm -hmm. and you know, for my knee, I'm really not trying to create excuses, but for my knee, I had an accident when I was 18, 19 years old in a theater production. And um, that accident constituted knee surgery. And then I was a runner 
for quite some time. And during one of my runs, I re-injured that knee and had to have a second surgery. And I've been told that because they took out so much meniscus from my knee, uh, there's very little in between, plus the scar tissue creates arthritis. Nobody tells you that when you go in for surgery. And then as far as my arm is concerned, I used to do this, well, I still do from time to time, but I used to like consistently do this very strange thing when I slept and I would, I don't understand because I was asleep, but I would throw my arms over my head and sleep like this. And I think over time, it just really <laughs> did a number on the shoulder. So mm -hmm. I've looked at these words. I've looked at these ideas. I appreciate mm -hmm. these ideas, but none of that has um, really moved the needle to healing. Absolutely. Because you have to do more than just read them. See, reading them just gives you an idea of where you're at. Like, for instance, when you said you were 18 and you had an accident, what kind of accident was it? I know mm -hmm. it was your knee, but what kind of accident? Were you on a bicycle? Were you in a car? What happened? No, oh, I was in a theater production. And, oh, that's right. Right. And it was a comedy. And I had made an agreement with this fellow actor that at the end of a scene, he would jump in my arms because it would be funny, ha ha. And while I was in the production, because it had been so last minute, I rue the day I ever made that choice to do that with him. Because when that moment came, I had actually completely forgotten. He was a large sized guy. I'm only five, four you know, normal sized human. And he jumped in my arms and my whole knee buckled. And I, my knee never recovered. The, the meniscus had torn. Well, you see accidents, the mental equivalency, one of them mm -hmm. and a main one for accidents is anger, you see. Mm -hmm. So, and what does the knee, the knee shows support. So now we're beginning to put the picture together. All right. You were angry about something. Oh, I think about a lot of things when I was 18 or 19, okay. for sure. And then now, and it's the knee. And which knee was it? The right or the left? The right knee. Aha. Uh -huh. The right in your cultural framework refers to male. If it's the left side, then you're having some kind of a challenge with a female. female. Okay. However, if you're in Asian culture, mm -hmm. it's the exact opposite. That's so interesting. Yes. So now we know that you're angry about something, you're feeling that you're not supported, and you are dealing with a male. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily that male that's getting ready to jump. Right. But another male that you had some challenges with. Mm -hmm. So what we would do would be to take you to assist you in finding which male is that? Was it your father? Was it a significant lover? What was it? Who totally. was it? Yeah, it was my father. Absolutely. Then we'd have to go and we'd say, okay, Debbie, what things do you think that your father did to hurt you? Notice we said specifically to hurt you. And the reason why we say that is this. When you understand that you create your own reality, you can no longer blame anybody for anything mm. because you have created it yourself. When you don't believe and understand that you create your own reality, you're just out there. He hurt me or she hurt me. <laughs> Excuse Greta. So something happened, and we don't want to do that on this show with you. You understand? Because you'd have to go and talk about what did you think your father did to you mm. that hurt you, that made you feel that you were not being nurtured by him. Wow. Mm -hmm. So that now you're angry. And you're angry about it. And you're also not feeling supported. Mm. 
So that means you weren't supported by him. So we have to, we don't just uh, uh, look at the physical aspects of something. We want to get down to the nitty gritty. Why did you create that in the first place? You see. So if you're just reading the mental equivalencies, the mental equivalencies just give you an idea. But you've got to go internally and look and see your, into yourself, into your beingness, and say, how did I do this? Right. Let me ask you, so yeah. this is good. <laughs> this is good. This is obviously, if I've read these things before, it just never landed. So this is decades ago. I don't today resonate with that but then yes absolutely and so does it make sense for this healing or investigative work to understand better let me start with the first question so does that mean that whatever happened was going on in that moment so many decades ago came to bear fruit then came to bear fruit when I was 32 and is now coming to bear fruit now because back then that wasn't handled, that anger, that hurt, that lack of support. Is that correct? Absolutely. Because you see, we look at the unconscious, which is the force now, Debbie. But the, uh, the unconscious holds everything. It knows when you belch. It knows when you laughed. It does not miss a beat. So that incidences that you had with your father that were very hurtful to you, it remembers them. Mm -hmm. And if you have not worked with the unconscious to say, look, we don't want this. I, I don't want this experience anymore. I'm getting rid of this. I want to change this. Yes. So one of the methods that we gave Greta that she shares with everybody is called the QDR, Quick Displace Replays. Okay. But sometimes we don't know all the emotions and thoughts See, if we go into the realities of where you are at with the relationship to your father and all of these, we're going to be looking at millions and trillions of realities simultaneously yeah. just for you. Mm. you. See, so, but what we can say is look unconscious. I know you use this to teach me a lesson, but uh, I'm really tired of it. Yeah. So then... Uh, the QDR says, it's a quick displace replace. The QDR says, I release all emotions mm -hmm. and thoughts. Sometimes we don't know all the thoughts around one thing. We've forgotten them. But the unconscious, see, at the conscious level, we forget it. But at the unconscious level, we keep it. So, but when you say, I release all emotions and thoughts that support me because see the unconscious is supporting you they it wanted you to know look debbie you're holding on to those old hurts from your father and you are feeling that you are not supported by him and you're angry about it so we want to show you that we want to help you develop that reality so that you can see that boom that's why you hurt your knee. Yeah. But you still didn't get rid of it. Let us finish with the QDR. I release all emotions and thoughts that support me. Notice supporting now. Support me. Now here comes your part. Creating and maintaining anger about my father. The QDR is where you talk about the very thing you don't want. It's the only thing you have right now. 
that will assist you in talking about other than going to a psychologist and sitting down and having talk therapy. We're not talking about that. We're talking about you doing something on your own. So I release all emotions and thoughts that support me in creating and maintaining anger over the things that my father did to me. That's the display. That's the talking to the unconscious. And then you say, here comes the replays, which is powerful. I love myself unconditionally. That is the replays. Now, it might go away in one minute. It might stay there. Then you've got to look at the energy. What is the intensity of what you're saying this at? Are you saying it at a low intensity? Where that, eh, I don't know if that's going to work. But are you saying, I know this works. I believe it. I know it. And I'm changing it. You see, there's a difference of the energy without you knowing energies. You see, the intensity of it. So we would deal with that, with that. And then we'd have to ask you, okay, write down all the things you feel that your father did to you that hurt you. Hmm. Because see, when you're a child, you're not thinking anything about, oh, I create my own reality. You're not thinking anything about that at all. You don't even know about reality, you see. But you know that you feel hurt. So... Therefore, write it down. And then you create an affirmation where you substitute things and you focus on what it is you want to experience. So the QDR helps you to function and state what you don't want, you see. But the affirmations state what you do want. So we'd have to start you on that path. And then, because we can do energy work all up the yin-yang and around the corner and up and down and all kinds of stuff, and you're going to look at us and say, my knee still hurts. Mm. You see what I'm saying? That your knee still hurts. Because the unconscious is showing you that. Now get this. Uh, pain is a form of Guilt, the mental equivalency to pain is guilt. You see what I'm saying? So you have a lot of issues just around dad that you would want to deal with. Now, the other thing about this is you went and heard it again. When that man, now just think about this. Here he is, twice your size. I see that he was kind of big. And you're going to let him run to you and jump in your arms. Now think about that. Was, no. was that really a wise thing to have done? No. Right. No. Okay, but because it hurt you. That's why it wasn't wise. But what happens is that you were still holding on to the little hurts that dad gave you. So now you're looping. Mm. Looping means I'm going around the corner again, y'all. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Yeah. I'm going around the corner. I'm going to see it again. Do me again. I didn't learn it the first time. Hit me with it, Mike. You see what we're saying? <laughs> I do. There you go. Uh, you did it again. Uh, you see. And now you're compounding it with all those little extra things called arthritis and all that kind of stuff. Uh, you see. So we'd have to look at the loop. What is your loop? You see. We'd have to identify the loop. You see, there's a lot more to this than just saying, let me put some energy on your knee. Do mm. you see what we're saying? Now, 
Now, after we do all that, then we can look at the knee. And you said your meniscus is practically all gone. Now we have two different things we can do here. We can just put something in there mm -hmm. that will take the place of the meniscus. Mm -hmm. Or we can go into your bone marrow and pull out stem cells and put the stem cells there and tell them now, regrow her a meniscus. Cool. You see, there's all kinds of ways we can do it. Or we can say, we can just, one one energy that we use that, the oh, the cells just love that energy is ice blue mm. it's cold we can put it in there but we have to make sure that it doesn't affect everything around you in other words you're not going to feel it cold you know so we put it in there but the cells love it mm. the cells love it then we have the arthritis that's sitting there and then we have this thing that we call acid. It's not really acid, so don't think we're going to be pouring acid. But we put that, we call it acid energy, because we're going to put it, as we so speak. Did we get permission? Yes, please, 100%. Did we get permission from uh, the higher consciousness of Debbie? I think we did. And we can do that, yes. Okay, so we do the higher consciousness. The force gives us permission. Because sometimes you don't know all that's happening that's going on but but it does but anyway it gave us permission so we can go into your oh yes it does look interesting let us put the acid over mm -hmm. inside just your knees what we're working on let's put the acid over the knee and it's going to start to dissolve the arthritis. We want the arthritis to dissolve. We don't. We don't want to keep you. We just. You can go. We. It's all right. And then Greta has. We gave her the energy, but guess what? She turned it into these things. She likes to make things look like things. So she cha She changed this energy. That energy that we're going to put into your knee to look like Pac-Man, you know, for that game, Pac-Man. Totally. <laughs> she loved Pac-Man at that time. So when we gave her the energy, she changed it into little Pac-Man. So you see all these things just moving around. So we're putting those Pac-Man inside there and mm -hmm. we're going to let them walk around and they're going to help chomp on and eat away the arthritis. You see. Mm. Now, does your knee hurt now? No. Okay. When does it hurt? Mm. When you're standing for a long period of time? I would say if I walk considerably, um, ah. certainly if I tried to uh, do anything weight bearing, such as go to the gym and do weights, uh, certain yoga positions, mm. anything that's more strenuous is, I, I mostly feel a very light, dull ache, but, um, and once in a great while, if I go to get up, it can be a little winky. Like I, I feel something a little weird that's not fully connecting in there. Okay. We're going to put, we use the cube. The cube is a shape. What they call it here is, uh, what do you call it? Sacred geometry. Oh, beautiful. That's for a different, uh, we don't necessarily, that's what humanoids call it. We don't necessarily call it, we just call it, it's a shape, a humanoid shape, by the way. Uh, and we're going, it, it oscillates. Because if we keep it straight, it's not going to, we want to intensify the energy. So it can emanate, but we don't want it just to emanate. We want it to oscillate. We want to raise the energy. Now, one thing we did not do was to set the energy for you. So we're going to set it at 999 zillion electromagnetic units to the 18 million, 18 millionth power. That's a lot of energy. 
And to make sure that you're okay with it, we're going to put 10 body suits on you. That's light energy over your physical body. We're going to give you 10 of them. And then as we go through the work, uh, then we will decide if you need additional ones. And then we will put additional ones there for you. So that means when we're using this energy, you're not going to be overwhelmed by it. How would we know? Would ask you, do you have a headache when it's all over? When you say no, then we know, okay, it's all right. Do you have a tingle? No, good. Then you're holding the energy and you can deal with it. So we're doing yours at the 18 million, 18 million power, and we're inside the knee. And we're going to put hmm, what we call three pronged prana. Now, Prana is golden color. Prana, you know, there are people that call themselves pranic healers, okay? And they use the energy from the sun. All right. Okay. We say three-pronged prana because some time ago, uh, two sons uh, were going to support Greta in her work. So they said to her, you can use our energy as well. Now, you don't know those sons. They haven't discovered them yet. They're way into the universe deep. But they send their energy for this process. So you have the energy of this son. You have the energy of the two other sons that are way deep into the universe. So we call it three-pronged prana. Mm. So we're going to take three-pronged prana and we're going to make it go around inside your knee. Mm. All the cells that are around your knee, all parts of the knee, all the bones of the knee, all of that needs to be healed. Because you see, when one cell is affected, the others they kind of sympathize. We keep telling them not to do that, but sometimes they sympathize. So they take on, they share the experience. Let's put it to you like that. So you have a lot of cells inside your knee that are sharing the experiences with each other. So we're telling them, we're going to put inside every cell of everything that's in your knee. You know, everything has a cell. So every cell inside your knee, we're putting three-pronged chronic gold in there. Then we're going to put that cell in a clear electromagnetic bubble with three-pronged chronic energy again. Then take us into the cells of everything that's in, in Debbie's knee. Okay, it's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of cells, you understand. So we're in every last one of them. We're looking at the organelles. We want to put the organelle in clear electromagnetic bubbles with three-pronged chronic golden energy. We want them to heal as well. That means your nucleus, your nucleos, your ribosomes, all of that stuff. Now we're coming to the mitochondria, which gives energy to the cells. Ah, we're going to double protect the mitochondria. It's special. So, and then to help it, we're going into the mitochondria itself. We're going to see the Krebs cycle, which helps to create the ATP, which is the energy. And we're going to put that whole cycle in a clear electromagnetic bubble with three prong pranic golden energy. And then we're going to take the ATP, which gives the cells energy. So we want energy for them to heal, you see. So we're going to put that inside a clear electromagnetic bubble with three-pronged pranic golden energy as well. Now the mitochondria is looking good. The, and what we want to do is we want also not only to heal, but to make the cells feel good. We're going to put a, what we said before, a oscillating light blue cube. It's going to oscillate. There it goes. In every cell that makes up your knee. We don't care if it's a tendon, a ligament, a muscle, circulatory system, nervous system. We don't care. In every cell we have done this. 
you see, that makes up your knee. Now you like to keep buckling your knee. We're going to put it, wrap your knee. It's going to look like a Band-Aid, but we're going to wrap your knee with ice blue wrapping, cooling it down. Because when you do those exercises, you start to get inflamed with it. We want to keep it calm. You might want to stop those exercises for a while, maybe a week. And then we're putting that, wrapping that with that. And then we're going to put a clear electromagnetic bubble over with that, with ice blue energy too. And then we're going to put a black bubble over that, the black holes, so we're having it to hold. Now Greta's created all these other names too, so just bear with us with these names. We're putting a clear box over that. It looks just clear like a regular box. It's energy. And then she calls the next one plexiglass because it's a little bit thicker energy. So she likes plexiglass. She, she likes naming things. So we put that on top of there. And then there's another one. Uh, it looks kind of light bluish and uh, kind of grayish. So it looked like her like steel. So it's not steel, Debbie. So don't think we're putting steel in your knee. But that's what Greta calls it, the steel box. So we're going to put the steel box over there. And then we're going to put a clear box over there. So it's going to hold the facilitation. But now who else must hold the facilitation? You must hold it. If it feels all right for one day, but then the next day it starts to hurt again, then you have gotten rid of the facilitation. So what you want to do then is call the facilitation back. You say, bring the facilitation back. Because where is the facilitation? Remember, we did that facilitation with you as an aspect. So it's in that reality. When we're bringing it and it's making your knee feel better, uh, then you're, we're bringing it. In fact, we're not bringing it. You're bringing it into this reality so that you can use it. So it can do what needs to be done. You see, so if it goes back and you say, oh, my knee hurts, then you go, then you got to think, oh, I got rid of the facilitation. So then you're going to say, facilitation, come back. I want you back here because it's energy and you are the energy. So you can tell it what to do. Mm -hmm. Bring it back. You see. Oh, my gosh. Thank you. That was exquisite. Really. Very powerful. Thank you so much. I just really receive all of that and your generosity in that process. And I'm very much hoping that folks who are watching and listening may be thinking about something in their life that hasn't been functioning on whatever realm like they would prefer. And they can also use this process for themselves to clear it, to clean it, to heal it, and to create something different. Very powerful. I want to honor our time and Greta. And mm -hmm. as sad as it is, because I could keep talking to you and engaging, I want to thank you so much for everything you brought today. And I'd like to invite when it feels convenient I would like to invite Dr. Greta back to Dare to Dream with Debbie Dashinger. And thank you, Realm of Beings. It's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure for us all to be here on this wonderful program. Thank you for having us. <laughs>
from this interaction. It's really beautiful what comes through you. Um, how are you feeling? Oh, I feel great. Excellent. I feel great. You know, uh, I'm going to be doing at the Consciousness Expo uh, psychic readings. Um, and they're free. So consequently... Is that at your booth or is this during your talk? At the booth. Wow, they're free? Good luck. Yeah. There's 10,000 people who come through the door. Holy moly. Well, that's going to be amazing. Um, so let's tell folks so they know upcoming is the Los Angeles Conscious Life Expo. It's February 9th through the 12th, held at the LAX Hilton Hotel. I know you're going to be speaking, Greta. Um, yes. Tell me what you're talking about when you talk. Well, the workshop is called uh, Creation of Reality, Free Birth to Birth. So we're only going to be talking about how do you create your reality before you are born? Mm -hmm. So many people talk about, well, you're creating your reality, but yeah. we want you to know and understand that you're actually creating your reality at all times before you are born. And it makes, uh, we, we bring the connection of you in a remembering way, because we say we're not teaching you anything new. We're teaching you something to remember. And mm -hmm. that is in that workshop, you learn that you are the force. And we bring it very logically so that you can see that that's really what you are. Wow. You've just, you've just forgotten it. Now the lecture is going to be, um, it's on, I, I've changed it so many times. I don't know what it says in the uh <laughs> in the conscious program, program. Or I have that voice idea. Yeah. but we're going to be dealing with uh, you'll get a workbook that we've created yeah, so we're, nice. going to, we're going to show you how to uh look at yourselves because we say we're twins we don't recognize we're twins because see we have the low vibrational mm. emotions and you have high vi vibration emotions you got them go both going so then we let people look at that. They write it in the notebooks if they want. They're going to get a journal that they, I mean, just a journal paper That's that they can nice. just write on the notes. And they get a lotus, oh. get a false lotus plant. Because we say the lotus is that one that, you know, at night it goes down into the water. But in the day, it always rises. You are a nice human, Dr. Greta. You really are. And uh, folks, if you would like to see her at her booth, hear her speak, interact with her, please join us. I'm going to be there. And the link to get your ticket to the Conscious Life Expo, whether it's for one day or all days, is in the show notes. I'd love to see you there. And Greta, this is Dare to Dream. What are you next, Dare to Dream? What are your future dreams and goals? One thing that we're doing is that we're working with um, two of the uh, facilitators. They're still in training with me, but they're doing a wonderful job. One, um, she calls herself um, a liaison, uh, a name that you would know her as it would be a medical intuitive. Uh, and then the other uh, facilitator, and she will, the other, this facilitator will be with me at the booth, kind of helping to run the booth. And um, she is actually doing the work. Like I worked on your knee, she's learning. So what we're doing is we're working with people. We have three men that we've been working with them for two years with Parkinson's disease. We have one gentleman that for the two years he's been with us, he's never had to take any Parkinson's medicine. And he went running up the hill and so forth. I mean, he's doing a magnificent job. Uh, the other gentleman um, is doing well. When he went to the doctor, uh, they the doctor was amazed and called in two other doctors to come in and look at him to see how well he was doing. They didn't expect it. And then we have another gentleman who's had it a little bit longer, but he's holding his own. And everybody is doing better. Even his doctor said, oh, you, you're improving. 
Yes. So that's what we're doing. We want to show, and we're keeping this, we're keeping records. We tape everything and uh, we're going to have a book. Uh, and later on, maybe sometime next year, we'll be bringing that out to talk about how to use this method in working with people to heal themselves from Parkinson's. And we also work with people who are experiencing cancer, cancer, uh, and just people who generally, uh, I have people that they just want a little bit more direction in their life, but we don't give them the direction. We show them how to develop the direction, mm -hmm. you see, because that's important. We want you to be able to fish. We don't want <laughs> to fish that's, for you. Wow. Thank you for everything. Thank you for the work you're doing, for your brilliance, for coming on the show today, for sharing so generously. I really appreciate you. It's just Thank been you. such an honor. Thank you. Thank you. We are honored. Notice I said we are honored to be here with you. Thank you very much. Yes. I end today's show with this quote from Michelle Ruiz. If people are doubting how far you can go, go so far that you can't hear them anymore. Subscribe to this number one transformation conversation, the weekly Dare to Dream with Debbie Dashinger. Leave a comment and share. Next week on the show is going to be the amazing Vivian Chavez, who is an Arcturian hybrid, an intergalactic healer, and universal communicator. Thank you so much for joining us on the show today. That was really actually very vulnerable for me to go through that with you, but the realm of beings made it it made it a beautiful experience, actually. It was very calming after all. And I hope you guys got tons out of that for yourselves and you can use this as your own process. Remember, don't just dare to dream, dare to turn all your dreams into your reality.